Yeah, start. Okay. Hello, everyone. Today we have with us Divyansh. Divyansh is a master's student at Stanford University, and uh, he is into uh, robotics using reinforcement learning and computer vision. Before that, he finished his BSc honors in computer science at Cornell. And uh, today we are going to discuss his paper, uh, which deals with the uh, Wasserstein distances for stereo disparity estimation. We look forward to your talk, Divyansh. Please continue. Yeah, sure. Uh, so thank you, Shama. Me to introduce me. Uh, I think she already told uh, about me. So I go. Uh, she did a pretty good job. So we skip that. Um, so yeah, you, like anyone can reach out to me on like Twitter or like uh, contact you by my email. You know, like my website is uh, divyansh.com. Uh, uh, yeah, Divyansh, your audio is a bit choppy. Bit. Oh, I think so. Is it better? Yeah, your audio. Yeah, yeah, your audio is a bit. Uh... Yeah, it is breaking a little. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, try talking now. Okay, is it better? Or is it still talking? Uh, still. Like, yeah, it's a more like it seems like you're far away. Okay. Okay. Uh, one, two, three. Yeah, so yeah. Far. Now it is a bit clear. Yeah, much better. Yeah. Okay. It is a bit. Okay. Uh... Yeah, I think it's my earphone. Yeah, go ahead. Please go ahead. Um. So sure. Uh. Yeah. So feel free to reach out to me. Uh. Anytime. Is my email on my Twitter account. Um. So okay. So about my work. Um. It's called like what's time distances for stereo disparity estimation. Uh. It will be presented in Europe's uh, 2020 in December. As a spotlight presentation. So the motivation of the work is as follows. Um, so how can we leverage machine learning to estimate the depth for all pixels in a scene while reducing the biases in our learning methods, as well as modeling the uncertainty and the multimodality? Um, so there are essentially two points. Like first is like reducing the biases, and the second is like the modeling of the uncertainty and the multimodality that my paper tries to cover. So first of all, depth estimation from images is a very crucial task. And uh, this is uh, essentially how you can learn uh, to reason about the world in 3D. So when you have something like, say, human eyes, you can only get like 2D images. Um, and you want to like perceive the depth. And that's how we convert uh, our 2D input to like a 3D input of the world. So that's how we get the 3D presentations. So as you can see in the, the animation shown here. And this is very important for applications such as autonomous driving. So in autonomous driving, you want to detect cars. And if, you, like, if a car is driving by, what are, the, what are the other surroundings? And this can only be done reasonably if you know like, okay, how far an object is. And we need depth for that. Another example is uh, robotic manipulation. If you have a robot like that's uh, picking objects and like placing them in like boxes, and uh, this is already being done like say Amazon warehouses, um, and like this is a very important task. And again, we need like uh, a good pretty understanding of the world to do it. Um, finally, an application is in graphics. So currently in graphics, we want to be able to generate new views. We want to like be able to like uh, create novel views of the world just using like the current input. And uh, so here you essentially try to just use uh, some images to try to see what will happen if you were to like look beyond the images. And this can again be done like if you know how to perceive about the world properly. Okay. So when you, uh, when we talk about uh, vision, there are many two ways to do it. One is using like a monocular vision, that's just using one camera. And the second is stereo vision. And this occurs with like two cameras. Um, the human eyes are example of a stereo vision camera. The problem with monocular cameras are like, if you want to do estimate depth with monocular cameras, it's not a well defined problem. And this can be seen from the ray uh, that's uh, shown here. So I think you can see my cursor. So this ray shows like for any uh, pixel in an image, the uh, object could be anywhere along the screen. 
So it could be anywhere in, along this line, and we don't know like what exactly is the depth. But if we have a stereo camera system, it's possible to find out exactly where our object is. And the reason is like if you know the object push, like the pixel location in the left image and the right image, and there's only one 3D point where it can triangulate to. And so this is an exactly solvable problem. But finding the pixel correspondence of this point in both the images can be hard. And uh, this is what uh, modern deep learning methods try to solve. <clears throat> so how this works is using stereo disparity estimation. The way to do this uh, is to predict a disparity map for all the pixel locations. And disparity over here is defined as the horizontal shift in the location of a pixel from the left image to the right image. And uh, given the disparity, it's very easy to estimate the depth of the particular pixel as they have a very simple inverse relationship. So modern methods try to first estimate the disparity uh, using two image pairs. And given the disparity, they try to get the depth map. Okay. This relationship between the depth and disparity uh, is very easy to show. And um, uh, we can get it easily by some simple geometry, but essentially the distance to a point from the cameras can be given as like the focal length of the camera multiplied by the distance of the two cameras uh, by the disparity of the particular point. And uh, this is a very simple geometric relationship that allows you to like recover the disparity from the depth. Okay. Um, so how do we estimate the disparity? So current methods try to find the disparities along a window. So you try to compare pixels in the left images to the pixel locations in the right image. So as shown in the zoom dot view, if you want to find the disparity, we try to find the disparity for different pixel uh, coordinates, and we can give a probability for each of these locations. And this probability can be used to estimate like which uh, disparity is the most likely and uh, what is the correct one. Okay. Uh, so before we go into like the existing methods for stereo disparity estimation, I would like to do a deep dive into like three D object detection. And uh, this is very important to understand like uh, why depth is important. And uh, this also is a very important topic for cell driving cars. Okay. So 3D object detection deals with uh, trying to detect the um, car. Yeah, hi. Uh, Would you like to pitch in a question? Uh, since you mentioned that 3D object detection is one of the most important component of a self-driving car, um, I've come across Robotics Club, which are trying to use a uh, Jetson Nano for this purpose. Um, what do you suggest? Is it uh, sufficient enough for a delivery robot kind of situation or not? Um, yeah. So this is a true, like, uh, there's actually startups trying to do, like, uh, like, food delivery or, like, build small robots that can, like, carry objects. And again, you need to do 3D object detection for them. So what 3D object detection tries to solve is like, uh, if you have a robot, you have other objects in your surroundings. This could be like uh, like people, it could be like cars, it could be other robots, it could be just be like stationary things. And it's hard for the robot to navigate unless it knows like what's there. Um, so that's what uh, 3D object detection is doing. It's essentially finding a 3D bounding box for everything in the surrounding. So let me play this. So like this is the view of a cell driving car. And this is the, all the three boxes it detected for the, the cars and surroundings. So once it knows like, okay, yeah, there's a car here. This is the location. This is the height width uh, that, of that car. Then it can like learn to plan like, oh yeah, I need to like make a trajectory such that I avoid hitting one of these cars. And uh, unless like you can have this sort of like perception, it's uh, hard to uh, navigate properly in such an environment. So normally how we do 3D object detection, at least for cell driving cars, is uh, we use a LiDAR point cloud, which comes from an expensive LiDAR sensor. Oh. 
problem. You know? Yeah, these are some methods uh, that we can use. Like mostly they're divided between LiDAR based and image based. Where image based methods are more recent and they just use images. Okay. So usually ceramic cars use LiDAR. So sorry. Yeah. So usually LiDAR based perception is common for ceramic cars. And LiDARs are expensive sensors that throw out uh, laser beams in the surroundings to estimate how far an object is. So the idea is you can reflect uh, laser beams from the surrounding objects and um, use the time for the beam to come back to estimate like how far it was. And this can be pretty accurate for finding like 3D positions of objects in the surround surroundings. And this can be seen from the, like, the diagram. So you can see you can get a very good uh, 3D view of everything. The problem with LiDAR is it's very expensive sensor. So for a car, it can easily go up to like 75K dollars. So it's like $75,000, that's pretty expensive. Uh, that's probably more than the cost of the car itself. So it's like almost doubling the, uh, the cost of the car and makes it like very hard to deploy and scale out. It is also risky to rely on a single sensor to do all your perception. And uh, one of the ideas in 3D perception recently is like, can you just use cameras to do uh, 3D object action? And this is an approach that's been taken by companies like Tesla. And uh, it's very similar to like humans. Like as humans, we don't need very over complicated sensors uh, to solve this problem. We just need like our eyes. Um, so ideally we should be able to do those. Okay. Usually the problem with uh, just using images is that it's very good at like doing 2D morning box direction. And like, like current networks are like really, really good at this. But when you want to detect 3D boxes, they fail. And the reason is like, you can't just estimate the depth. And without the depth, it's very hard to put like a 3D box on anything. So we just show here, like for 2D, they can be pretty good. Like camera-based approaches versus LiDAR-based. But for 3D, they can fail. Okay. So an idea here is if you have uh, images, you can first estimate a depth. So you calculate the depth for the whole scene. So as shown here, and once you have the depth, you can convert it to a point cloud. So essentially, if you know the the pixel coordinates, U, V, and like the depth, you can use it to convert it to real coordinates X, Y, Z. So that's the real world coordinates of a point, and you can do that for all the pixels. So once you have that you can obtain a representation that's called the pseudo LiDAR representation. And this was part of a previous work that I did um, at Cornell. So just using the depth from the images, you can get a 3D point cloud that's called the pseudo LiDAR point cloud. And this is actually a very dense uh, point cloud with accurate uh, representations for all the objects. And this can be compared to the original LiDAR that's estimated using a sensor. So this is just from like a machine learning method. It's like all estimated, and whereas this is from an actual sensor that's like uh, uh, estimating where objects are. And uh, we can sort of stack them together to see how accurate they are, and like you can see, they align pretty well. Uh, uh, Divyanj, I had a question. I think this is your previous work, right? I think yes. previous to this work. So, what is going on here? Like, how? What uh, is the input to estimate? Uh, now we are trying to estimate. 3D point cloud, right? That is the contribution of this work? Yeah. Oh, perfect. So then how do you, what is the ground truth for when you try to estimate? Sure. So the idea here is to sort of merge depth estimation and uh, object action. So if you have the, let me go back. So if you have all this original LiDAR uh, as a ground truth, you can use it to get the depth for your images. And uh, you can use it to like use it as a supervision to train your depth network. So if you want to like predict, if you have the lidar, you can use it to get like okay, what's the depth for each of the cars? And using that as a supervision signal, you can try to predict a depth map. And uh, once you have the depth map, you can like sort of project it back um, to get the point cloud again. Okay. So once you have this point cloud, you can plug this uh, method in existing. Uh, 3D object, object detection networks. And there's a lot of work recently on this just because of the interest in cars. 
they this network's take an input a point one and are able to emit like 3d boxes for like our pedestrian spikes and uh, instead of the lidar point cloud we can just feed them through the lidar point cloud that's from the camera images and uh, have it work pretty well so here the green boxes are from the pseudo lidar and the red are from the lidar and you, and uh, it's uh, obvious from here that they align pretty well okay and uh, why does this sort of representation where you actually use like a pseudo lidar like 3d point cloud work better than just using 2d images so our explanation here is this is important because we are encoding a 3d dimension into into the network so the network itself doesn't know like the world is 3d it, it doesn't have the preconception of that but by saying like okay we have a point cloud where every point is like xyz it knows like okay yes we need, we want to like have this dimension that we want to include people have exist like tried before to just use a image and a depth map as an input to a network and try to do like warning box uh, detection but usually it doesn't work well because again like given an image and a depth it's not obvious like what's the relationship between them is but for a point cloud it's immediately obvious like okay yes there's a th third axis the depth dimension that you want to take into account and uh, the pseudo lidar work essentially uh, was the first work to show that uh, that you can actually do very good 3d bonding box detection just using two images and yeah so the key idea is illustrated here given two images you first try to estimate the depth given the depth you can get a point cloud and you plug the point cloud along with say, the images into a 3d detection network uh, that's made for like lidar but it just works for the pseudo lidar to get the boxes and once you have the boxes you can just solve this problem and so yeah we just have the different points in the key here yeah okay so ending the deep dive um so the important key takeaway is if you have the depth you can solve a lot of different problems and one of them is like uh, 3d of detection and uh, like in my in this work uh the vasistian distances we also show that how the improved depth can lead to better 3D detection accuracies. So if you have better depth, you can improve the your accuracies on like all the downstream tasks where you're using the depth. Okay. So what are the current methods for stereo disparity estimation? So in terms of implementation, recent methods they employed a neural network to that takes a left and right image as input. For each pixel, you output a probability, as you saw before. And this is usually over a discrete uh, values, like one, two, three, four. And this distribution can be multimodal, uh, especially for pixels that lie around object boundaries. So you can imagine if there's a pixel that lies at the boundary of a car and like the, its uh, background, then um, there's no exact depth here, like it could just be on the car or it could be behind. And in that case, we can get like a multimodal distribution as shown here. Uh, Divyan, I had just one basic question. What do you mean by multimodal? Uh, what is the yeah, sure. principle? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you can imagine like if we have a pixel on a car, then we can the pixel is at a particular depth. They're just like how far that particular car is. So like, imagine like there's a point here. So we just say, okay, that, this is just the distance of the car. So if you look at the Fourier distribution, it is just like peak at some point and and so kind of like small probabilities everywhere else. If, it, if the method is good at estimation. So we can just say like, okay, yeah, that's it. But that's what we care about. But if we have a pixel that's on like object boundary and then it's not clear like, okay, like do we care about the object on the left or do we care about the object on the right? So it's essentially the boundary. And in that case, like we can have like multiple peaks. So here, like there are two peaks, and this is what it means to be multimodal. Like, uh, like if if it's like ambiguous, like we don't know which uh, depth to choose. So there could be multiple depth values uh, for a single pixel. Okay. 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 Got it. okay. So we can highlight how the neural network works. Usually the approach is to use speech extractives for the two images so the left image and the right image both uh, take a simple feature extractor which could be like a cnn network that has weight sharing 
given these features, we can concatenate the features along different disparities to create something that's called the cost volume. And uh, once you have the cost volume, you use 3D convolutions and, uh, and, and a softmax to output a probability. So this ends up outputting the, the final probability for all the pixels. So you can imagine this is a 3D volume because we have like a 2D input and we have a, we have a 1D probability distribution for all of them. Okay. So here, each uh, point in this volume, say C of U, V, D, represents for each pixel at coordinate U, comma V, what is the probability of a disparity D? And this is uh, what this volume is trying to represent. Okay. So once you have this distribution, you want to output a final disparity value. So there are two ways to do this. The first way is to output the mode. If you have a distribution, you can just take its mode. That's just the max value. The problem, so the the good thing is like this can give you the, the disparity which has the highest likelihood, but uh, it can only exist on the predefined values. So if we had disparities that were like one, two, three, four, and this is because our pixels are discrete. So if you have if you have discrete pixels, you can only estimate like what's the discrete horizontal shift between them. And so you can't estimate like what was the sub-pixel disparity. Another way to do is to use the expectation. So given this distribution, we take the mean of the a mean of the distribution. So the nice thing is that it can allow any value. So this could be any arbitrary real value. But uh, this value can lie in a low probability region. So in this case, the expectation lies at a value uh, where there, there's actually no disparity, where the, which sort of like a minima of this distribution, if we try to interpolate it. Okay. And one thing to notice over here is even if your disparity is wrong by a small amount, it can have a, a very large effect on your final depths. And the reason for this is that they have a reciprocal relationship. So even a small change in the disparity can have a huge effect on your tasks. Okay. There are, um, so I highlight some existing works that uh, are very milestone approaches in this area. So this work is called GCNet. This was the first work that tried to use a neural network uh, to predict probabilities for the disparities of the pixels. So the key idea is the same. You have like two networks that uh, give you the weights uh, to get, estimate the features. Once you have the features, you try to create a cost volume, do a bunch of 3D convolutions, and try to uh, use a argmax to get the disparities. So this method us usually uses the mean. So given the distribution, you take the mean um, to get uh, where it should be. Or you can also just take the soft argmax. So soft argmax here is essentially the mode. Another recent architecture is called the PSM map. Um, this operates uh, a lot same as, a, as essentially has the same basis, but it just uses like a more complicated 3D convolution network as uh, shown here. And this is a very standard approach for disparity estimation or current methods. Okay. So both these methods essentially try to use the expectation. And the reason is if you just use the, the mode, then you can't get sub-pixel disparities. So if your pixels are one, two, three, four, or five, six, something like that. So the thing to notice is like all your pixels are integer value. But if you want a disparity that's say like 1.2, um, you can't do that. But if you calculate the expectation of this discrete distribution, then you can predict any real value. And uh, people have tried to use this property to get like better disparities. And it has been shown like using the, the expectation can be better than just using the mode. But the problem is the same. Like if we have a distribution which has multiple peaks, then your expectation will probably lie between this, those peaks. And in this case, your method will fail. Okay. 
To resolve these problems, we propose continuous disparity networks in our work. How this works is that in addition to the probabilities, we also output an offset. So this can convert this discrete distribution to a continuous distribution, which can have the arbitrary real support. We can also output a shift in mode in this case that can predict the high probability disparities and can uh, go beyond like the fixed values to have arbitrary real values instead. And this is one just one question uh, what would be examples of the offset value would be uh, uh, like if the probability is one uh, what would be the value of the offset yeah so usually you want the offset to like change your discrete to continuous so in this case uh, like in our work we usually just make the offset from zero to one so essentially it can be a for this uh, particular bar we wanted to shift it anywhere between one and two and uh, so on. So we usually allow the offset to be like zero to one. So it can like take any, it can feel all the like particular values that are possible for the distribution. And this simple modification can work with like uh, any of the existing state of our disparity networks. Okay, um, so any other question here? Yeah, so there'll be two values then. Oh, what you're saying is there'll be two values, the probability and the offset both yeah or will be a single value shifted by offset um no so the idea is like so this thing is a probability so like if we estimate the probability at like one two three four and you also output an offset for like all this one two three four and so once you have the offset like you can say like okay i want to shift this by this offset that you estimated for the the value one then you have offset for the value two so you just shift it by that value okay. um yeah so the entire thing is shifted by offset. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. The nice thing is like uh, now if you you can still take the mode, but now your mode can apply anywhere um, along the disparity dimension. So it could be like any real value. So it's not fixed anymore. Okay. Thank you, Rich. Yeah. So here we show a comparison of the three D points derived from the estimated disparity without the offset and with the offset. So notice that with the offset, the 3D points can be placed at continuous locations, accurately describing the scene. Um, so any questions about this? Uh, I, I will uh, interrupt you if there's any questions in the chat, Divya. You can go okay. ahead. Actually, there was a question in the chat regarding disparity map. It would be great if you could take it. Uh, can you brief us about belief propagation method for disparity map? like how efficient is using it instead of geometrical method you can take it up now or in the end whenever you like um sure let me just take it now mm -hmm. so yeah currently belief propagation is not that popular at least for like deep learning um, so yeah the way any, is any issues with that oh so yeah belief propagation like was used more with the uh, patient networks and uh, like with the current deep learning methods, which are more like which are less probabilistic, but more like uh, like a value predictor. Like it's hard to use uh, methods like this. And uh, like currently, like deep networks are mostly like using like just using back propagation as an alternate for training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So usually, yeah, usually like uh, at least for all the current methods that uh, are trying to do disparity estimation. Uh, they rely on like a geometrical method uh, to do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sounds good. Okay. So once, so we also compared the learning methods for disparity estimation. So what the existing methods try to do is once you have an output disparity, which can be a mode or the mean, you try to compare its distance from the ground field. And uh, this can usually just be the smooth. Let me go far. Okay. So the distance between these two distributions can be estimated just using regression. So this could be like a simple regression loss, like L1 distance or L2 distance. But the problem with this is like we are not actually using the learned distribution. And uh, we are not able to capture the uncertainties or the 
or the, the behavior of the distribution around object boundaries. So if there were like multiple peaks in this uh, distribution, we are not like using that information. We are like discarding all that information here. Okay. So instead in my work, uh, we propose to learn with persistent distances. And the idea here is we directly want to align the predicate distribution with the ground truth distribution. And we can do this by detecting the ground truth disparity value as a direct data function uh, as shown on the right. Okay. So what exactly are the Wasserstein distances? So what they try to do is given two distributions, um, mu and uh, nu, you try to estimate the minimum cost of transposing points from one distribution to another. So this can be seen as the minimum work that needs to be done to transform this x distribution, um, mu of x into nu of y. So you want to shift all these particles uh, to the other particles and try to minimize the work done. So this can be given as a distance of uh, the transformation. And uh, once we have the expected distance, you want to find the minimum work that will be done uh, to do this transformation. And this is what is the Wasserstein distances try to measure. And uh, that allows it to have a very general definition that can work for arbitrary distributions. So generally, Wasserstein distances are a, a very general measure of a transformation of two distributions. Okay. So in our case, we only have one value for our target distribution. So if this is our predicted distribution and this is our target, our target is just like the origin depth of the scene. So this can, so as shown previously, this is just the direct delta function. And so we just have one point. So this signifies the problem a lot because instead of dealing with like a whole way to like uh, move the, move the, say the particles from one distribution to another, we just want to move them to like this one particular point. And uh, this can simplify the equation a lot. So we can just see if we try to use this definition to simplify everything, we get a very simple equation that the, the distance between the two distribution is just the expected value of, uh, the, of the coordinates of uh, mu minus the, the coordinate of this point, uh, let's call it by star. And so we are essentially measuring the distances between each of these points and taking the expectation. Okay, we can plug this in into our network. So for our network, we have a probability distribution that is given as probability of D given like the pixel values. And uh, our X is essentially the disparity plus the offset. And the D star is just the two disparity value of the ground truth. So this gives a very simple equation that can be used as a loss function um, in our case. Okay. So we want to learn with the process and distances. And this is the cost of moving the predictive distribution to the ground truth distribution shown in view. So the, we get a very simple equation uh, to calculate the distance. So that's just the, semi, the expected value of uh, shifting all the red bars to the blue column. So this loss function allows you to jointly optimize the offsets as well as the distributions that the network is predicting. It's also very efficient to calculate for one day distributions. In general, what's and distances can be hard to calculate for arbitrary distributions for like, but in our case, we only deal with one distributions and we can get a very simple closed form solution uh, for this loss. Uh, Divyansh, one quick question. Was this the only uh, distance method that you thought of or were there other methods which were not as efficient or did you dabble with any other technique? Yeah. So usually if you have two distributions, the first few people start with this using like the 
scale divergence. And uh, that is essentially giving you the likelihood of uh, what of your predictions given the ground truth. And if you have like the like say like something like cross entropy loss, uh, it, it usually measures the scale divergence between two distributions. So in a case, we actually show that scale divergence does, doesn't work that well. And one reason here, um, so let me go back, is like KL divergence can only be defined on for two distributions that are the same support. So if it have the same support, okay. So if a distribution is say defined on like uh, like four points, like one, two, three, four, we can only compare it with like other distributions that are also defined on, on the same points. But if you have a like arbitrary distributions, which have like um, like not not non-common support, like here where the ground truth can lie anywhere, and your your predictions could be anywhere too. Um, like you can, like usually KL divergence may not converge, so it can give you something like plus infinity or something, uh, because it's not designed to work with such distributions. And there, like was and distance are like a better way to do it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. In, in the in our appendix, we actually show like uh, you can try to approximate the the KL distance by by using some sort of like smoothing on your distribution, and um, it actually gives you something that's like a, a classification plus like a regression loss um, on your offsets. So it's like you're trying to predict your offsets to the correct value plus like trying to get estimate the correct probabilities. But uh, even in that case, like this uh, loss formulation works a lot better in our experiments. Okay. So another nice thing about Wasserstein distances is that they can work for arbitrary distributions. So even if your y is not single value, if I suppose your like ground truth is multimodal, even then we can easily calculate the most time distance within the 1G distributions. So it can be shown if you have two distributions mu and mu, the most time distance is the area between the cumulative distributions of both. So f is the CDF of mu and g is the CDF of mu here. And the most time distance is just the area of the two groups. So we just show it here. And like, again, this is easy to get through. Oh. Uh, Divya, one quick question. So in uh, this case, throughout uh, your paper, multimodal is a pixel having two depth values. That's it, right? Just to be clear. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, that's what you mean. Okay. So we can see there are two outcomes on this uh, method that you've shown. First is we have reduced the biases. So we are directly predicting the mode. So we don't care about the mean because the mean doesn't make any sense when we want to talk about how likely something is. And we are directly learning the distributions. So we are discarding like, okay, that's, we have to first predict the mean or a mode. Only then we can compare this uh, distance to the ground truth. But we are saying like, okay, sure. Let's just predict a distribution and see like how good is the distribution compared to like what we want. We are also able to model the uncertainty and the multimodality. Um, so we can like learn this multimodal ground truth. So if we if we don't have a single depth value, single uh, depth value, you can still learn with it, and uh, and this can actually happen because of uh, multiple reasons. One is when you have like a, something like a lidar sensor that's used to take the depth value, it's actually not aligned with your like cameras, and uh, because of this, you can actually get like multiple depth values falling into the same pixel bin. So and you can also have like object occlusions. So some objects visible in the left image, but it's not visible in the right image. And again, you can get like multiple depth values for this particular case. And our method can deal with all this arbitrary edge cases um, using this. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we are we are essentially predicting a posterior disparate yes, distribution uh, using the initial ground truth um, in our case. So our method is can be viewed as being Bayesian because it's uh, directly dealing with distributions uh, using the initial count. Okay. Okay, let's start with like the results. So we show results on two main data sets. Uh, one is called CINFO, another, another is a PT data set. CINFO is used for serial disparity estimation. So it has like left, right images uh, from like synthetic uh, 
that are all synthetically generated. And uh, KD data set is a more general data set that's used for autonomous driving. So it usually has like uh, images of uh, cars that are collected from like uh, real, life, real life driving. Okay. So our method can reduce the one pixel error. That's a standard metric for zero disparity estimation in comparison to state of art networks like PSMNet and JNN, uh, getting significant improvements. So here, like less is better. Similarly, on 3D of detection, our method can improve the average precision of the bounding box detection compared to the state of art networks like Sudalaya plus plus and DSGN, uh, reaching the new state of art. So we can show that by using the depth from our CDN network, that we are able to actually reach the best performance on this particular data set. Okay. So Divyansh, is this like an extension for the pseudo LIDAR uh, paper? Like in the previous result, uh, you're showing uh, disparity network plus uh, pseudo LIDAR. Is this like an extension? This uh, is a, yeah, yeah, the stereo uh, 3D. So yeah. is the uh, disparity network an extension for pseudo LIDAR? Um, so not necessarily. So what this practice is trying to do is like, how can we just get better depths? But once you have better depths, you can use it for anything else. So Good. in a way, just show it like this can work for pseudo ladder. But uh, like here, our focus is essentially just getting better depths. Got it. Good. Thank you. Okay. So we can show qualitative results uh, for our network. So we show the zoomed in view of the baseline method compared to our, our method. And you can see that our method tends to get better, better depth estimates near the object boundaries. So it can preserve like this uh, small boundary um, pixels that are present. Similarly on the data dataset, our method is more robust. So it doesn't have not noisy artifacts like uh, the ones shown in the figure. Okay. Our method can also produce sharper disparity estimates. So for the person standing in front of a wall, highlighted in the yellow box, our method can give the correct estimates, preserving the shape of the person and the background, as shown by the red ones. Whereas existing methods tend to blur the two together, as shown by blue. So this blending of the foreground and the background objects, this can lead to highly incorrect data, depth estimates, as shown here. So this, uh, all the blue points, this, this are all wrong. And this can cause uh, a lot of errors for downstream tasks, such as like PD of detection, which can lead to like huge safety risks. Whereas our method tends to remain accurate in being able to distinguish different objects. Uh, to like, be honest, oh, yeah, well, just one quick question. Why does the baseline differ so much from the ground truth, that blue to yellow? Is there any reason for it? The yeah. Of the red so, it is like they are essentially in the mean. Um, so what happens is like if there's some yellow points, the yellow points over here are essentially like the ladder points. So if there's some yellow points here and some yellow points here, it it, it tries to find the mean on the boundaries. Okay, okay. okay. Like when you try to do that, it, it gets like values in the middle. And uh, we can see like it just creates like this whole like long tail. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. But uh, like in our method, we are using the mode. So we, we don't have this, we either have like, okay, I'll be pretty clear on this object or, or the back object, but we won't like predict like a bit in the middle. And mm -hmm. that's this like one nice thing of uh, our method. Got it, got it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, so this can be like a huge uh, safety risk if you predict arbitrary points. Your, your 3D text network might think like maybe there's a long, long truck here or like there's some vehicles present here which are not actually present in the scene. And uh, this can cause your cellular card to like behave uh, incorrectly. So we also highlight this um, effect more. So the red points are from our network. The yellow points are the actual the actual counter, and the blue are from the basic methods that are using the mean. So from using the mean, you can see like on the boundaries they have this like huge tail, and this is this just is a very uh, noisy artifact which is which is like not, not really good. This is like one of the key things uh, that my work uh, actually tries to solve. 
and is like we're doing it. Okay. Um, okay. So usually for serial disparity estimation, the methods tend to degrade as we look at further away objects. And the reason is like as far as if you are far away, you the object representation in the image is smaller. So as you go further away, you will become uh, smaller in the image. And if you have like a smaller object, it's harder to estimate the, what its disparity shift is. And so usually you, you have this uh, effect for disparity estimation that uh, it, it almost uh, climbs quadratically for the error. But here we are able to show that our method is actually able to do a lot better compared to the baseline on all the depth ranges. So that's essentially for, picks, for objects that are between like zero to 10 depth, um, say 30 to 40 depth, so on. And for our case, actually the improvement gets better as you go further away. So this shows like, like this particular method can work better if an object is like further away. So it has like lesser error for further, further away objects. Okay. Okay. So as I talked before, with Wasserstein distances, we can learn with multimodal gauntlets. So in our paper, we actually describe a way how you can construct such a multimodal gauntlets using the disparity values of the nearby pixels. And if you train with multimodal gauntlets, you observe a faster convergence in the learning. So this is shown by the dotted line, oh, sorry, the dashed line here. So we try this uh, for different metrics. One is called like the three pixel error, the other is called the end point error. And we show like for the both metrics by using multimodal ground truth as supervision, we can get fast conditions. So on the right, we show visualizations of some predictions of the network early in the training. Uh, specifically for when the network has only been trained for two epochs. So like when it when it's like sort of here, we try to visualize what the network is actually like doing. And we see like for the baseline methods, it's very coarse on the boundaries. So the, the boundaries are like pretty coarse, they're not good. But for our method, the boundaries are more smoother. And uh, so this shows like, our like this sort of multimodal uh, supervision can help in learning the boundary spectrum. Okay. So, yeah. We can also show some like key ablations for the study. So first is the effect of offsets in the most time distance. So we show, okay, what happens if we remove one of those two? So the first uh, row is the baseline method where you're not using any of these. Now you can use offsets along with the baseline way of learning. And you can see like they actually lead to some improvement, but not much. Okay. Another thing you can do is you can use our Western distances learning method, but not use offsets. In that case, the problem is when you try to use the mode as output, you can only predict uh, disparity values which are integral. So you can't predict something that's like 1.2. If your ground truth is 1.2, you can only predict one or two. So in that case, your endpoint error, which is trying to predict like, okay, how, this is essentially the, the distance to the ground truth. So this is like the L1 distance to the ground truth. Um, so this is like higher because uh, we're only predicting integer values, but your, uh, but your one pixel error and the three pixel error which is essentially saying, is your prediction between one accurate up to one pixel, or is your prediction accurate up to three pixel, um, corresponding to your ground truth? And then we say we see you actually got a good improvement compared to the before methods. Now, when you add the offset along with the Western distances, now you can like predict any real value. So we actually see the like uh, the endpoint error which is the absolute distance between the ground truth and the prediction uh, actually goes down and we get like uh, much better results compared to everything else. Uh, Divya, mm -hmm. one quick question. What is this ablation studies? Sorry, I am not aware of this uh, ablation studies. Oh, what so we're just, 
impact of like different uh, parameters uh, in our sort of work. So what if we were to not use something like the, like so what 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 was what was the reason something is working better? So we are just trying to like experiment out with the uh, different. Okay, good. Like you are trying to infer based on uh, uh, which parameters you use and not use something like that. Yeah, so we're seeing like um, what is the thing that's actually making the matter work. Okay. And uh, we also see what's the effect of using difference, uh, different divergence methods between your predicted distribution and the counter distribution. So you can actually use uh, um, different ways. So as I talked before, we can use something like the scale divergence. And you actually see it doesn't work that well. Um, in our case, we use the velocity in one distance, which gives you the best results. We can also use uh, versus in two distance, which is very similar to versus in one. But the difference is when you try to, to predict the expected cost of uh, shifting a distribution, um, instead of using like the L1 distance, you just use the L2 distance. So it's just the, the mean square distance that you use here. Um, so this can also be pretty good, but it's like a bit worse compared to the versus in one. And the reason here is that the versus in two distance is more sensitive to outliers. So if you have like noisy ground truth, it can be more sensitive to it. Okay. So in conclusion, the, our method tries to accurately estimate the depth for ambiguous regions. This is very important for safety of robotic systems, where if you don't have the correct depth, you can't have correct perception of the world. That leads to incorrect estimates for theory of detection, or say like your uh, anything you're trying to do with like some sort of like robotic system. Our method also is able to naturally account for the uncertainty and the multimodality, and uh, it removes all the sub optimalities that are present in the existing learning methods, and as well as uh, gets a better representation for the three D information. So, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Divyansh. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. It was very informative. Uh, uh, we'll just uh, wait for the audience to ask a few questions. I had one question. Uh, in your paper, uh, you talked about, while giving the background for this work, this uh, work is also similar to stuff such as multi-person pose estimation, single shot multi-box de uh, detector. So what is the common uh, denominator between uh, that work and this work? So the common way, the common denominator is like that both of them try to predict like a, a like try to do a classification plus a regression problem. Mm -hmm. If you have two stage detectors, first they try to classify whether there's a bonding box at some particular location. Mm -hmm. And once they have it, they try to predict an offset to define it. And our method operates similarly in some sense. Um, but a very novel thing that we do is like use the Wasser and distances. So no one that I'm aware of has actually used Wasser and distance uh, in a similar setting. Yeah, 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 yeah. They haven't, yes. Okay, 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 okay. So that is the key difference between you. And by using uh, that distance technique, you are also beating the state of the art. No? That is also one. Uh, uh, yeah. One okay. So, okay. yeah, for that, we are able to do like better on the foreground. Mm -hmm. So, because, um, most of the objects on the foreground should, it, it, it's able to do better there. Mm -hmm. And actually, yeah, we, we get like better performances compared to like the existing methods. Mm -hmm. Like again, in architecture and like use this job training, uh, mm -hmm. you can make, make that do. Yeah, and also I didn't find the thing you talked about. Uh, uh, you dabbled with other techniques as well as well uh, mm -hmm. before zeroing on this uh, distance technique. So that uh, I am not sure whether I caught it in this presentation. Is that here or is it in the paper? So it's it's in our appendix. So ah, it's like okay. afterwards. And I, I sort of like just discussed this part where we talk about like uh, using the care divergence. So this is also like something that's part of the appendix in the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
oh, you're talking about KL divergence. Yes, yes. Learning with approximated KL divergence, right? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. So it had a RMSC error higher than. Uh, okay. Yeah. And this actually leads to like, uh, so if you use this sort of approximated KL divergence, mm -hmm. you get a form that using like existing work that mm -hmm. use like uh, regression plus uh, classification. So you just mm -hmm. get a classification uh, error plus like a regression loss, mm -hmm. which are like the two terms. But mm -hmm. when you use this like most distance, it's like everything's combined in like one term. Mm -hmm. and it sort of like works like very like naturally, like we are able to like jointly optimize both the things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Usually like when you also do this uh, regression plus classification, you have like a hyperparameter, which is like a like a lambda which controls like what's your weight for each loss. And like in our case, we don't need to use a weight because like it's all combined naturally. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. Very good work, Divyansh. Very good. Uh, and off topic, uh, in your pseudo LIDAR paper, how did you land on this concept? I just wanted to know because I think uh, everything was built on that. I think that was the baseline over which uh, now we are building on other work. So how did uh, you land on this while working on pseudo LIDAR. I think that was, uh, uh, who was it? Uh, sorry, it was uh, Rui, Rui, I think, right? Into uh, uh, Yeah, it came like multiple works on pseudo LIDAR. So yeah, the, the most recent work was with Rui. Um, so I think the, one of the inspirations was uh, just the boundary fact. So um, yeah. So one of the things that, that I wanted to solve was just this problem where you're incorrectly predicting point clouds. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I want to see if there was a geometrical way where you can like try to estimate the depth mm -hmm. and like the way that that ends up uh, like using the Western distances and the offset. It's mm -hmm. actually a very good way to predict it. And also, uh, you have used a WIMO uh, data set. Even that was uh, very recently only released, right? If I'm uh, um, um, not wrong. Uh, the Google uh, WIMO open data set, autonomous okay. driving data set. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think WIMO is a very recent data set for autonomous driving. We actually don't use it in the in our paper. We just focus on like this too. Um, but yeah, I think like Vimo is also like it's pretty new. It's like like uh, it was released last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was just wondering whether uh, that had an effect on the results, or uh, uh, you could do it without uh, the data set. Oh, um, sure. So I think we don't like evaluate on like Vimo. So we like in this work we don't use it at all because okay. uh, we want to focus more on like. Just the depth, so we don't want to focus that much on like video detection. Um, but I think like, the problem with like way more data sets, like it's very big data set, so it takes a lot of time to like create networks on it. So I think mm -hmm. that's that seen as like the main problem with uh, that particular data set. Good, 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 good. Very good, uh, Divyansh. And I was wondering because the work is so similar, how, how did the reviewers uh, react? Was there any questions they asked? Because while reading the paper, you are referring to so much similar work uh, and this area is also pretty crowded from what I saw. So how did mm -hmm. you uh, distinguish yourself? Yeah. Like what did they ask uh, you? So, yeah. So, yeah. So I think we didn't actually expect this like uh, as, as authors, but like all of our reviews for New York's work were actually pretty good. So I okay. think all of our reviews were impressed by what we're trying to do. And uh, I think people have tried to like use uh, similar formulations in the past, but no one has actually done this like for like the uh, sort of this like depth estimation. So like our method is doing like a probabilistic estimation. So it's using like the uh, theoretical concepts from statistical learning um, to get like better disparities. The current contributions that people usually make is like, oh, how can we get a better architecture? Or how can we get a, like better representation of the ground truth? Can yeah, we yeah, add yeah. more like cemetery information or uh, stuff yes, like yes, that? Yes. But I think people have not actually investigated the learning. Um, just like mm -hmm. how can we do better learning uh, that mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. in the present? 
Good, good, very good. Because I saw, because I'm also not uh, that familiar with 3D Point Cloud, but when I saw your references and all the related work, it was such a crowded uh, space. So usually it is incredibly hard to bring something new and highlight something novel. So yeah. Good work. And what was yeah. the time frame from the initial idea till uh, the final experiment? What is the? Uh, sure. So I would say it was probably like uh, four to five months. Okay. So I actually sat down this idea in December, mm -hmm. uh, like December of 2019. Mm -hmm. And um, like running all the experiments and uh, writing the paper mm -hmm. uh, up to like maybe like June. So maybe like six months. Yeah. Okay. okay. And I think both were tested on the same data set, no? uh, the pseudo LIDAR and this. Yeah, we, yeah, I think like we try to just use like autonomous driving uh, as a focus. Mm -hmm. That's why we have very similar data sets. Okay, okay, okay. Good, good. Very good, uh, Divyansh. I think, uh, and very, have you released the code as well? Because I saw supplementary material and this thing. Is the code also released? So we actually have a GitHub repo. Oh. And uh, I'm planning to release the code after like uh, like cleaning it up a bit more. Mm -hmm. So maybe within like the next uh, two three weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, one more thing, there are many research students also in the audience. Uh, usually, a uh, common problem faced by many people in research is you focus on one idea, develop it. Uh, and by the time you take it to the paper stage or before you submit, something very similar might come up in archive or in any other conference or uh, wherever. So how do you deal with that? Do you focus on multiple ideas at the same time? Or uh, is it, uh, how do you counteract that? Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think that's actually very common. And like I've uh, worked with a lot of PhD students and that happens to like, uh, like anyone. Um, so there's no good way of uh, like sort of avoiding this problem, but uh, yeah, people usually just try to do like better like background search, like mm -hmm. has anyone tried to use this method before, or mm -hmm. like can we actually come up with something that might be novel? Mm -hmm. And uh, it happens like later, like you've already started working on the research, and you're it's actually like pretty mature, and you find out like oh, like someone actually did something very similar to you, mm -hmm. and they'll. People like sort of pivot at that point, like uh, just try to change uh, the methods or the or their main contributions. Mm -hmm. Um, so like I think that's like a very common approach that you need to like sort of pivot your method. Um, mm -hmm. if, like someone has done like something very similar. Good, 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 good. So in this space, I believe you also review papers because you have. I believe you re do you review papers as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so what uh, common pitfall do you see when people are presenting their idea? And I believe they're uh, related to 3D point cloud. Or, um, yeah, or I think it depends. Like I've reviewed a bunch of like, uh, like different papers. Mm -hmm. uh, it can range from like reinforcement learning to like maybe like just like the uh, point cards. Mm -hmm. um, but like, I think like one common pitfall is uh, the, like people are not able to present their ideas clearly. Mm -hmm. So if, if they have a very good idea, mm -hmm. they are not actually motivated. Like what, what is the reason? That you want to actually do things your way, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. what does your method actually add? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like if you don't have the proper motivations, it's uh, hard to, like especially as a reviewer, to see like okay, what's the contribution of a particular method? Like mm -hmm. I will use it. Understand. Very good, spectacular presentation, Divyansh. Very well explained. Because uh, while reading the paper, I had to look up what is. Uh, multimodal, monocular, stereo vision, but everything you explained in the initial part. Also, paper is also very well written. So very good work. So hopefully we'll see okay. more, uh, more great from uh, work from your lab. So in your lab, what else is going on apart from this? Hmm. So this, this was uh, all work done at Cornell. And uh, I think my lab is focusing a lot on like autonomous driving. Mm -hmm. um, so like some recent work was just like the pseudo LIDAR, um, mm -hmm. like this work. We are actually also focusing on like doing tracking. So I think like one of some of my like uh, lab comrades like they are uh, trying to do like sort of like improve tracking. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's also a recent focus. Okay, okay. Uh, there's one question in the chat. Akash asks, have you worked on RL uh, on real world? 
and then transfer to real robots. Uh, I think he's talking about transfer learning. Uh, you can just look it up in the chat. Akash, mm -hmm. or uh, maybe yeah, Akash, you can unmute and go ahead now. Uh, Akash, please unmute this second. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, am I audible? Yes. 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 Please go ahead. Yeah, so I wanted to ask this question, like if you have, uh, like you have mentioned that you have worked on reinforcement learning on robots. So like, have you uh, actually implemented RL algorithms on robot in the real world? Or have you trained them before in simulation and then transferred them to the real world? Like transferred the policy to the real world? Yeah. So usually the problem with reinforcement learning is it's, uh, it takes a lot of data. So it's very simple, inefficient. And uh, it, so, so usually you can train it uh, maybe like, Train it for what's equal to like 100 real days and maybe like one hour in simulation. And if you like, it's not possible to like do that in real world. Um, so the usual approach is like what I've done is like uh, first try to like train something in simulation. And once you have a good, good, good policy, um, you, trans you transfer it to a real robot and then try to find it there. And I think that's sort of the, the main approach that people take with enforcement learning. Okay, thank you very much, Divya. Uh, and also, this work was supported by NSF, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, lot of uh, materials. Is there. So, what did this add to? Is there an overall bigger project that uh, this is adding to? Um, so, I will say not necessarily. Like that's all my advisors' uh, like funding software. <laughs> yeah. Um. But I think like, uh, so I think we're trying to like focus more on autonomous like driving. Mm -hmm. So I think like uh, this, this might be like a part of like a, like a bigger work, like the lab is trying to do on like, uh, like how can we try to do better mm -hmm. autonomous driving. Uh, and uh, we have, I think uh, Apple has put it on their phone as well. So is there any range difference? What is the fundamental difference between uh, Velodin, uh, LiDAR and the normal mm -hmm. ones that they're putting on the phone, is there any range? Yeah. So I think the difference is, uh, um, one is just the range, like how far can it see? So let me just highlight it. So like when you have LIDARs, so you can you essentially have like laser beams. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have, it's essentially the number of lines. So you can imagine like there's like one laser here, one laser here, let's see if I can go on. Um, yeah, so you can have like multiple, like, so you have essentially have like, uh, in this case, you have like 16 vertical lasers. And uh, what what happens is like the sensor is like rotating continuously. Mm -hmm. It can like scroll the lasers to like a 360 degree angle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you like in labs, like for robots, we can just use like a eight line uh, light art because mm -hmm. that's sufficient uh, for them. But usually for self driving cars, we use something like that to a line. And the reason is just like, uh, uh, for a self driving car, we want to see the things that are very far away. So this could be up to like, uh, usually like the target is like up to 100 meters, uh, which can be very far. Whereas if you are like, just like have a simple robot in a lab, um, mm -hmm. you only care about maybe like uh, the next 10 meters. Oh, okay. Very good, very good. Um, right. Uh, Omkar has been raising his hand from quite a long time. Right uh, Omkar, now. go ahead, please. Go ahead with the question. Unmute yourself. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, hello, everyone. So I am Omkar. I am in fourth year in 83 Chief Production Engineering, and I am uh, quite uh, focused on self-driving technology. So Very me and Akash and somebody also like we uh, run a research lab. Like uh, the, it's called the Mickey Mouse Lab. So the Mickey Mouse Labs aim at pushing the boundary of AI and robotics research for the future, and uh, we're working to deliver the benefits of self-driving technology and robotics Omkar, for the is, future transportation. Yeah, is there, a, is there a question? Question, is there a question? Do you have a question? Uh, no, sir. Okay. I don't have any questions as specific, uh, but I want to have some uh, yeah, yeah. Communi uh, Divyansh, uh, one -one communication. With yeah, Divyansh is available on Twitter, and I think you can reach out to him. Uh, he's uh, yeah. will be more than happy to uh, entertain any questions related to his research work. So, yeah, just so, so, to be at me or on Twitter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Divyansh. We want to keep uh, you any longer.
So thank you very much. It was incredibly useful, and thank you for the explanation. It was uh, really okay, yeah. Thanks for hosting me. Okay, it was a great thank experience. You, yeah, thank you. Thank you.